What's up everyone? It's your favorite self-loathing German here. So democracy is kind of bad, right? It's slow to address problems. Without an informed voter base, it's pretty much worthless and gets easily paralyzed by corruption. The best way to keep a democracy functioning, one might say, is the free and open exchange of ideas, because if a democracy does not allow for that, it stops being one. But what if someone uses his freedom in this marketplace to take away the freedom of others and ultimately to dismantle democracy? And this is a problem that all free societies faced in the past and face today. Adolf Hitler himself decried that he had been stripped of his right to free speech after being banned from speaking in Bavaria before abolishing the same right as soon as he had the ability to. Before that, the Nazis were pretty open about how democratic processes were just a means to an end for them. When they first entered the national parliament in 1928, Joseph Goebbels remarked, Like the wolf breaks into a flock of sheep, so shall we. And in the same speech, Goebbels mocks the very idea of democracy and calls it outright stupid for paying them to destroy it once in parliament. But does it have to be that way? Does a democracy have to grant its citizens the weapons to abolish it? Why don't we take a look at the different answers to this and at the end, we'll hopefully figure out what the biggest threat to the marketplace of ideas currently is. I love democracy. I love the republic. Democracy is the system of government which has the hardest time combating its internal opponents. While Germany actively suppresses the activity of non-violent extremists, the United States for instance largely follows the marketplace of ideas approach in which good arguments will beat out the bad arguments and therefore state intervention for the most part isn't necessary. And Germany is no stranger to the solution actually. When the German constitution was drafted, one of its co-creators proudly proclaimed Germany to now be the most democratic nation in existence and another one claimed Germans to now be the freest people on the planet. Although I have to correct myself here a bit. By German constitution, I mean the constitution of the Weimar Republic. Yeah, that whole thing didn't work out so well. But that alone doesn't prove anything. Democracy, putting democracy in air quotes here, in the United States has existed for longer than any German state. Ideally, we shouldn't have to crack down on citizens with non-orthodox opinions, or as Rosa Luxemburg once said, Oh my god, I cannot believe that someone with the channel name Three Arrows would dare to quote Rosa Luxemburg. May I remind you that it was the German Social Democrat. As Rosa Luxemburg once said, freedom is always the freedom of dissenters, before she was murdered for uh, being a dissenter. Anyway, let's look at how modern day Germany handles this compared to the American way, but first, we need to clarify what we are even talking about here. Part 1. Extremism and you. What constitutes extremism is seen differently in the two countries we are talking about. In Germany, extremism is very clearly used to describe parties, movements or individuals who strive towards the abolition of the democratic order. In the US, the term is used much more broadly and refers more to a style than actual goals. An extremist in the American use of the term is someone who is relentless and unwilling to compromise. And while this description is perfectly fine to use for the various far-right movements that exist in the US, it also could be applied to someone like Martin Luther King who was frequently labeled an extremist for his determined fight for civil rights. In his famous letter from Birmingham jail he wrote, The question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists of hate or will we be extremists of love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? A relentless fight against the status quo is enough to be labeled an extremist in the US. And that might be problematic on its own, but if one considers to give the state the ability to crack down on anti-democratic elements, there is need for a much more specific definition. So for this video, we will run with a German understanding of the term. If the modern German state determines you to be an extremist, it is possible within the bounds of the German constitution to employ various levels of state repression against you. And you don't even have to actually do anything that realistically threatens the democratic order like committing a terrorist attack or planning a violent coup. It is enough to actively pursue the abolishing of it to get into the crosshair of the state. Part 2. The Institutions Now unlike other intelligence agencies, the German constitution protection does not have any police authority. They can't arrest or interrogate you and that might seem weird at first glance, but given the legacy of institutions like this, 
The Gestapo comes to mind. This is actually just a protection against the government employing another secret police force that snatches up dissidents. They mostly employ surveillance and infiltration to gather intel on groups they suspect. That is, if they don't, violate the rights of German citizens on behalf of British intelligence agencies, destroy evidence that links their informants to neo-Nazi terrorists, employ former members of the SS and Gestapo after the war, advise far-right parties on how to avoid monitoring, prevent far-right parties from being banned by not disclosing the actions of their agents, failing to observe Mohammed Atta while he was living in Germany prior to 9-11, contact the employee of innocent people and get them fired, or monitor innocent left-wing politicians while a literal neo-Nazi terror organization operates unstopped for over 10 years and is even supported by certain members of the constitutional protection. If they're not doing any of that stuff, they sometimes also do good things. Putting that aside, important to note here is that this agency is not supposed to expose everyone who rejects democracy or the German state. If you're part of a group that openly states democracy is bullshit, that kind of stuff is protected by the right to free speech. But as soon as there is a political effort that goes against democracy, the German state does not fuck around. If our constitutional protection classifies a group as extremists, they hand over their information to our constitutional court, which is then able to bring out the big guns. This goes as far as to restrict several civil rights like freedom of the press, your property rights, the right to assembly and a few others. The court is also able to dissolve political parties like the Socialist Reichsparty in 1952, extremely subtle rebranding there, or the Communist Party four years later. The Weimar Republic had comparable institutions but they were only able to do something once the threshold of violence had been crossed. In the US, a comparable institution like Germany's constitutional protection that monitors non-violent extremists doesn't really exist, although it existed briefly from the early 50s until the 70s in form of the FBI. But that was just because black people were demanding their civil rights, so I guess something had to be done about it. There was also this whole communism thing going on, but that's a disaster for another day. Theoretically speaking, the US Congress also has the power to establish committees that would fill this role, but the last time they tried that, it didn't really work out so well either. So since then, this approach has never been tried again, and the FBI is not only forbidden from monitoring non-violent political extremists, but they are also not allowed to publish reports about anti-democratic efforts that lack the context of explicit violence. But who are we kidding, it's not like the FBI would stop this stuff just because a few innocent lives get ruined. Nonetheless, officially they don't, and here's where we get to those organizations who fill the gap today. In a true American fashion, it is left up to the private sector. The two biggest watchdogs monitoring extremist activity in the US are the Anti-Defamation League, founded in 1914 to combat anti-Semitism, and the Southern Poverty Law Center, which aim it is to preserve the achievements of the civil rights movement. Now these two organizations both have multiple approaches on how to combat hate groups or extremists, but it mostly boils down to a kind of specialized journalism. A big part is actually exposing what we see. Educating people about what an ideology is, exposing something that people may not be familiar with and say, well, this is the background of this group or individual and this is why they are extreme. So educating and exposing tend to be hand in hand and that is a big way that we confront and combat the extremism that we see. Both organizations also train police officers and work together with law enforcement in sharing information or shedding light on local extremist groups. One of the key differences between the understanding that these watchdogs have compared to Germany's constitutional protection is that they themselves reject the government taking a preemptive approach. I do not think that the country needs new laws. I do not think that the country needs to slash groups that have radical views but that are not engaged in criminal violence. It seems that we are close to right here. We are an organization that has no police powers. We cannot put anybody in jail. We cannot prosecute anyone on a criminal charge. So the fact that we gather what is really political intelligence about people and groups is no harm, right? We may know that you slept with somebody who is not your wife, but we cannot put you in jail, right? It is quite different. The government cannot collect political information except in the context of a criminal investigation. What I am trying to argue is that it is a very clear separation. It keeps the police from becoming political and it keeps the people who are gathering political information, which will be us, from becoming police. It seems like these organizations have struck the perfect balance between holding up free speech and combating extremism, but they are also often criticized from across the political spectrum. Here you have the Rosa Parks of pronoun usage talk about the SPLC in the context of leaving Patreon because a YouTuber was banned for using racist and homophobic slurs. A whole variety of companies and organizations spearheaded in not least by the Southern Poverty Law Center, that hateful organization, yeah, the worst. Um, that 
has decided that they're going to uh, compel, encourage, uh, what? Defame, perhaps, companies that don't band together to regulate what they see as hate speech. Majid sued them to, to, and actually won. So there, there is a pushback, but this is just another level of the stand. It's like they cannot be trusted to be on the boards of any of these organizations that are deciding what terms of service. Yeah, but they are. But criticism does not just come from the right. Recently, the ADL called the support of the BDS movement by US Congresswoman Ilhan Omar alarming and also implied supporting boycott divestment sanctions towards Israel contradict supporting a two-state solution, something that is objectively not true. BDS is a form of political protest against Israel's occupation of the territories in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. It doesn't argue for a one- or two-state solution, but aims to overturn Palestinians' restricted access to travel, water, healthcare, civil rights and labor protections. Criticisms like these pop up from time to time, but a structural critique of these watchdogs is that they bought into the left's cultural Marxist agenda to end the white race. Just kidding, folks. The real, not deranged criticism points towards the organization being a private business that relies on donations. In the year 2011, the full assets of the SPLC amounted to 223.8 million, with the CEO's yearly salary coming in at $350,000. Tied to this criticism is the accusation that the ADL and the SPLC inflate the existing threat by extremist groups to conjure up more funding. And while that accusation makes sense considering private companies don't have any kind of oversight, the SPLC is completely transparent with the funding they receive and how they spend it. The numbers they deliver regarding hate groups usually also reflect the findings of the Department of Homeland Security. Granted, the threat of extremist groups towards the average weekly standard columnist might be next to non-existent, but even in tiny numbers these groups pose a very real threat to people of color and other minorities. Now which approach might be the better one isn't really a question worth asking, because Germany on the one hand has already answered that question for itself, and in the US there's really no other possible legally okay approach than private watchdogs to monitor non-violent extremist activity. Or is there? Part 3 free speech and the constitutions. In the US, you're allowed to say much more openly without repercussions from the government than in most of Europe. And that is something a lot of Americans are very proud of. The differences between America's and Europe's approach aren't actually that fundamentally different when examined up close. Because even the United States does not have absolute free speech. You still can't yell fire in a crowded theater or knowingly defame a person without potentially getting in trouble with the government. The goal of laws that limit free speech in the US is to prevent citizens from abusing that right to harm other people and it's really no different in Europe. A prime example that is often subject to criticism is Europe's punishing of Holocaust denial. On the surface, everyone should agree that every citizen should be free to destroy his reputation like that and banning opinions, abhorrent as they may be, comes close to authoritarianism. The same could be said for free speech restrictions in the US though. For instance, you can't blatantly lie when advertising a product you sell and what your opinion is doesn't matter. Maybe it's your opinion that someone who takes brain force pills will grow by 6 inches, it is objectively false though. In the same way it is objectively false to say there was no state-sponsored genocide of Jews under the Nazis. And while there may be no customers who get harmed by denying the Holocaust, banning it serves the protection of everyone in the country. The goal of Holocaust denial is not reaching a more accurate historical consensus, but the rehabilitation of Nazi ideology. If you follow that to its conclusion, the idea of the Holocaust being a hoax becoming widespread would end up threatening not just Jews, but everyone in the country. The prospect of certain claims becoming mainstream, climaxing in the destruction of democracy, ultimately can justify that democracy to prevent this from happening. But most important of all, the state should not be allowed to overreach and censor free speech under the fig leaf of protecting democracy. In Germany, neo-Nazis hold marches and demonstrations all the time, but they have to abide by the rules. That means not using Nazi iconography or openly calling for the abolishing of democracy. This way, they are essentially doomed to a kind of political children's ball pit. You can have your little chance at marches, but if you openly call for overthrowing democracy, you lose your ball pit privileges. A neo-Nazi in this situation of course will decry that you're limiting his free speech, but the appropriate response should not be to hand him the tools to take away your and everyone else's freedom, but to pat them on the head and explain that you're not allowed to play with the other children if you can't abide by the rules. 
If this makes your alarm bells go off and the government restricting speech for political reasons makes your stomach turn, that's a reasonable position to have. But if you're also from the US, this is already happening around you. Recently the Senate passed a bill that gives state and local governments the right to divest money and refuse to work with companies that take part in the earlier mentioned BDS protest. Senator Marco Rubio, who pushed for this bill, claims that the constitution only enshrines the individual right to use speech to boycott companies like Caterpillar, whose bulldozers have been used to topple Palestinian homes in the West Bank to make room for new settlements. Rubio's bill, on the other hand, gives the state the right to boycott people for doing so. Now I have my criticisms of the BDS movement, but no matter how you spin this bill, it is the government exercising power to limit how US citizens can use their free speech. And you probably won't see any of YouTube's free speech heroes lose a word about that. But if a private company refuses to work with someone like the founder of G Hardwatch, who was cited over 50 times in the manifesto of far-right mass murderer Anders Breivik, it apparently becomes an unacceptable threat to free speech. Very interesting where the priorities lie there. Anyway, the United States is usually much more lenient when it comes to demonstrations. An example of this would be the neo-Nazi rally in Charlottesville, where people openly displayed Nazi iconography and chanted blood and soil, or Jews will not replace us. The general consensus is that this might be offensive, but it is protected by the First Amendment. True threats of violence that are directed at a person or a group of persons that have the intent of placing the target at risk of bodily harm or death are generally unprotected. If we take chants like blood and soil and race war now with honesty, one cannot deny that these are announcements to commit genocide if they should get the chance to. The counter argument to that might be that these people won't ever actually get the chance to do that since their opinions are universally condemned, but it remains a threat nonetheless. In the same way I could say that even if I yell that I'm gonna set a fire in a movie theater, that doesn't mean that anyone will take me seriously or that I'm actually gonna do it. The truth is that chants like the ones in Charlottesville have a much more potential to get people hurt or killed than yelling fire in the biggest movie theater in America. The more spaces these people get, the more spaces they will take over. And theoretically speaking, they could get voted in and change the constitution to reach their goals if there was majority support for it. This is actually something the United States Constitution and the one of Weimar Germany have in common. They are both value neutral, which means everything is up for grabs if the majority demands it. In the current German constitution, this is not the case. The very first paragraph, for instance, human dignity shall be inviolable, inviolable? Inviolable can never be changed even if all of Germany wanted it to. The structuring of Germany as a democratic republic can also not be changed without Germany ceasing to exist as a political entity. The goal of these eternity clauses are to prevent the stripping of certain rights even if the government views it as necessary. The end of the first German democracy is usually marked at March 24, 1933 when the Reichstag passed the Enabling Act which destroyed the democratic foundation of the country and handed all of the power to the Nazis. There is no legal way to turn Germany into a dictatorship again compared to the United States where, theoretically speaking, it is possible. It might be highly unlikely, but it's not impossible. Even with America's two-party system, extremist elements can still rise through the ranks. In 1989, former leader of the KKK David Duke was elected as a state representative in Louisiana and later lost the election for the US Senate with 44% of the votes. What's even more disturbing is that although Duke lost the election in 1990, 57% of white men still voted for him. But here's where we get to what makes American democracy so great. It might come off as me presenting the German approach to democracy as the perfect way, but that's not true at all. America has a long history of democracy, partially at least that Germany can only be envious of. What ultimately brought down David Duke's campaign was the public outcry his candidacy got. America has prevented becoming a fascist state like Nazi Germany or Franco Spain, largely because of its long history of democracy and self-governing. America was founded on the premise of individual liberty for white people, while Germany was founded as an authoritarian monarchy. The US constitution might theoretically be changeable, but there's virtually no document the public views as more sacrosanct than the constitution. And while America's conception is rooted in horrific racism and the exclusion of parts of the population, the underlying principles it was founded on serve as a stronghold against anti-democratic forces today. Well, partially it does. There's one threat to democracy that the US and Germany are both continuously falling victim to and that represents the biggest threat to our self-governing and the marketplace of ideas. Part 4. Capitalism versus Democracy 
Here's where our analogy of the free exchange of ideas as a market comes full circle, because markets can and repeatedly do fail, with disastrous consequences. Western nations today are mostly understood as liberal democracies, meaning democratic nations with free markets. It's important to not conflate liberalism with democracy though. For most of their history the two concepts were even seen as directly opposed to one another. And the fathers of economic liberalism like Benjamin Constant certainly weren't fans of democracy. Historian Helena Rosenblatt even goes as far as to say, indeed, it would not be wrong to say that liberalism was originally invented to contain democracy. It's also not like the early liberals didn't have a point in thinking that way because capitalism and democracy follow completely different logics. Democracy is all about striving towards the common good with debate, compromise and majority decision making. Capitalism on the other hand is all about the bottom line and the decisions are not made by what the most people want, but by managers and capital owners who themselves are only part of a hierarchy. Now here is where a capitalist might say that these two systems are actually a match made in heaven because you have the freedom of the free market with that market still being bound to the will of the majority. If we're looking at the political developments of the last 40 years, that is not really what we're seeing. A 2015 study by the Center for the Study of Elections and Democracy on Voting Patterns in the US Senate showed that senators' preferences reflect the preferences of the average donor better than any other group. Different studies on the subject also point in the direction that money is corrupting our politics and with that our democracy. The truth is that the socio-economic inequality, which has risen sharply since the 80s, directly transforms into political inequality. As time goes by, these developments only seem to get worse. After two landmark decisions by the US Supreme Court in 2010 and 2014 that essentially opened the floodgates for unlimited amounts of money to flow into the electoral system, former President Jimmy Carter stated openly that American democracy was essentially dead now. It violates the essence of what made America a great country in its political system. Now it's just an oligarchy with unlimited political bribery being the essence of getting the nominations for president or being elected president. And the same thing applies to governors and the US senators and congress members. So now we've just seen a subversion of our political system as a payoff to major contributors who want and expect and sometimes get favors for themselves after the election is over. At the present time the incumbents, democrats and republicans look upon this unlimited money as a great benefit to themselves. Somebody that is already in congress has a great deal more to sell. But it wasn't always that way, or so I'm told. The capitalism that emerged after World War II was subject to much more control by an interventionist welfare state that tried to keep its worst excesses in check by regulating and stabilizing the economy. The goal of what was called rein capitalism was to ensure that the market served the majority and to make a frictionless coexistence possible. Wolfgang Merkel in his essay Is Capitalism Compatible with Democracy concludes this era like this. The period proved to be the zenith of coexistence between social capitalism and social democracy in northern and western Europe. Yet it remained incomplete, precarious and different from country to country. What killed this version of an organized capitalism was essentially that capitalism outgrew its constraints. The regulations that existed up until that point were developed in the context of the nation state and the rapid globalization partially rendered the tools of a democracy useless. Threatening a corporation with higher taxes if they don't stop blasting smog into the air that we all have to breathe becomes an empty threat if the corporation can just move to a different country but still serve the same market. And instead of setting up global institutions to combat this, we get even more deregulation and less interference by the state. In the situation that we are in right now, America's free exchange of ideas and Germany's attempts to fortify democracy become completely useless to protect our ability to self-govern. Even the most powerful institutions and brilliant constitutions we can come up with aren't worth much if the power keeps flowing away from these institutions and concentrates elsewhere. And the effects on our democracy are popping up all over the place. At the time I'm uploading this video, the Utah Senate just passed a bill that will roll back Medicaid expansion, which the people overwhelmingly voted for in the 2018 midterms, essentially overruling their democratic mandates. The same thing happens in the US in terms of climate change. Over 109 countries around the globe have enacted some form of policy regarding renewable power and 118 countries have set target for renewable energy. In contrast, the United States has not adopted any consistent and stable set of policies at the national level to foster the use of renewable energy. That should be worrying on its own but the real problem is that this disparity is not explained by public opinion in the US which is much closer to the global norm. 
It exists because the people who have a disproportionate influence on our democracy have an interest in it being that way. The current head of America's Environmental Protection Agency, which is the arm of the federal government to ensure cleaner air and protect human health, is a former coal lobbyist. And while you might scoff at the idea of me putting oligarchs in the same box as extremists, if we diverge from the German definition for a second, letting people die because they can't afford medical treatment is extreme. Going against the scientific consensus on climate change being an existential threat to the human species for the temporary profits of a few already rich assholes is extreme. And it doesn't stop there. Simultaneously, there are constant efforts to misinform the public by pushing for bills like the Environmental Literacy Improvement Act that propose balanced teaching of climate science, which is essentially coded language for including something in the curriculum that goes against the scientific consensus. The same people that push for this legislation, like the Koch brothers, also funnel money into organizations like the Young Americas Foundation, who use that money to spread conservative ideas on campus. But in all honesty, they should really stop getting Ben Shapiro because that's just wasted money at this point. So let's say, let's say for the sake of argument, that all of the water levels around the world rise by, by let's say five feet over the next hundred years, say 10 feet by the next hundred years, and it puts all the low-lying areas on the coast underwater. Right, which let, let's say all of that happens. You think that people aren't going to just sell their homes and move? Get ready to snatch up all that cheap underwater property, folks. The US is often singled out in showcasing how capital threatens democracy, but it is really no different from Europe. Here it's just less obvious. The most recent example of that would be the uncovered Comex scandal in which the European taxpayers were robbed of 55 billion euros in taxes with a practice called dividend stripping. I'm sorry, I have no idea why these financial scams all have sex-related names. But just to put that number into perspective, if you would take Germany's entire costs for the refugee crisis in 2016, you'd still be 5 billion euros behind the sum that these individuals stole from the taxpayer. Add another 30 billion, and you have the amount of reparations Germany paid the Jewish victims of Nazi crimes over the last six decades. The reason for why this stunt was even possible in Germany were bills proposed by the banking lobby in 2010, which passed unchanged. And even if you would want to change them now, the system has grown so complex that the government relies on the private tax advisory industry to craft legislation. The connection between capitalism and extremism becomes even more apparent when the system collapses. The leftist dictum goes, fascism is what happens when capitalism fails, but that doesn't always follow. For example, the financial crisis that catapulted the Nazi party from the fringe into the mainstream hit the United States much harder. But compared to Germany, people in the US did not turn away from democracy in their desperation. But we can acknowledge that the emergence of fascism is much more complicated than just being a result of capitalist failure and still recognize that the two are undeniably linked. In Germany, the ripple effects of the 2008 financial crisis, for instance, still manifest in negative interest rates that devour the lifelong savings of the average worker. It's no surprise that this person being continuously failed by the status quo might end up turning towards Germany's far-right AFD party, a party that harbors a political agenda which contains first actual indicators for it being directed against the German democratic order, according to a recent 400-page report by our constitutional protection. Part 5 what do? It is important to be nuanced about when intervention is necessary to keep the freedoms that makes democracy worth preserving. The point of comparing the US to Weimar Germany is not to scare and to argue for the US to adopt tighter restrictions on free speech, but to show that there is no free speech principle that applies to every country the same way. It's also not like Weimar only failed because of its constitution or any other singular reason. But what we can say definitively is that democracies fail when citizens stop believing in the legitimacy of democratic institutions. And even if we are able to protect ourselves from extremist elements, what is currently hollowing out our institutions is the encroaching oligarchy that the US and Germany are struggling to ward off. Maintaining a democracy is constant struggle and one that sometimes requires being realistic instead of idealistic. I would love to live in a world where ideals and Voltaire quotes were all that mattered, but history demands that we put facts over feelings. And the fact is that pointing out to your countryman that he is committing the naturalistic fallacy won't prevent him from bulldozing your body into an open mass grave because he deems you inferior. In the same vein, it is also a fantasy to think people who have the power to bend democracy to their will won't use that power given the opportunity. Extremists break the marketplace of ideas because they don't play by its rules. The same way the rich can bypass it entirely for their own benefit. 
If we want to keep our freedoms and ability to self-govern, we should not just view the Richard Spencers of the world as anti-democratic threats, but also the Kochs, the Mercers, and everyone else who is able to replace a good argument with money. This video was not made possible by the Koch brothers, although I hear they pay pretty well. It's sponsored by the nice people over on Patreon, or you can join if you like and get some nice rewards like access to commentary videos, which are basically me sitting in front of a camera commentating my own videos. If that's something you would want to see for some reason, link is in the description. Big thanks to YouTuber Maxi for fitting the role of the angry YouTube commentator. Usually she's not that angry, so make sure to check out her channel via the link down below. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's all I have. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you the next time. Until then, have a good one.